to insects, you know, a square foot of ground is a vast wilderness. And there's whole complicated systems going on continually. But we just kind of move too fast. We're too large to see it. We got to sometimes slow down to have the um, eye of a child to really see what's going on with the insect world. And um, so this story I'm telling, it's I'm going to take you guys back 100 million years. You see, 100 million years ago, the world was much different than it is today. And the world was far more drab. There were f far fewer species of plants and animals living on Earth. The floral um, landscape of the Earth was mostly like cycads and ferns, conifers. And, uh, but then something happened. And no one knows how this happened. Einstein spent a lot of time on this, and he couldn't figure it out. He called it the abominable mystery. You see, ferns and cycads and conifers produce, reproduce by producing vast amounts of pollen and setting them out into the wind or into the water in hopes that a one in a billion chance, one of those grains of pollen will reach um, a, a plant of the same species and pollinate it. Um, pollen is a protein. It takes a lot of energy to create pollen. So somewhere back there 100 million years ago, plants figured out that insects were a much, much more efficient way to move pollen from one plant to the next. So what happened 100 million years ago was plants started moving pollen from one, one uh, plant of one species to the next of the same species, and flowers were born. And boom, the um, biodiversity of Earth exploded. The angiosperms, the flowering plants, created um, niches, ecological niches, for hundreds of thousands of different insects, and with that, mammals, birds, reptiles, and it makes a beautiful biodiverse earth that we have today, thanks to the love of bugs and flowers. So, um, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, one second. When we see flowers, um, flowers are so beautiful that sometimes we think that uh, flowers almost were like created for us, you know? They're so beautiful, they smell so good, their patterns, their colors, everything about it. We give flowers to each other to show love. But truly, flowers were created for bees, and so it's just kind of amazing that bees and humans have the same aesthetic. Um, the beautiful colors of flowers, um, Bees have ultraviolet vision. They see ultraviolet light. And so when we see like a, a purple flower or a hillside covered in like black sage, we might see the greenery with these little purple specks. But for bees flying through the sky, they're going to look down and see a field of glowing purple lights, you know, calling them in like a flashing sign. And the smells um, of flowers are so good. Flowers smell good because of the nectar in them. Now, nectar is not um, a part of, it's, it's no part of the actual fertilization of plants. All nectar is, is a sweet treat that was created to attract insects that would then carry the pollen from the male part of one plant to the female part of the other plant. And all those uh, um, shapes of flowers that look so beautiful, if you look at it through a bee's eye, you'll see that, you know, uh, a flower like an iris that has a big, petal is a perfect landing pad for a bee to land on and sip the nectar. Um, yeah, so bees, there's 20,000 species of bees on planet Earth. And uh, um, most bees are solitary bees. They live alone in little holes in the ground or little holes in trees. There's bees like bumblebees that live in colonies. There's 19 species of honeybees, and what makes them unique is that they're a perennial social insect colony. That means the whole colony lives year-round, as opposed to something like bumblebees that starts from a single queen, builds up a colony, and at the end of the year, the colony perishes and they make new queens. 
So how honeybees became a perennial social insect is a really interesting and unique story. Bees um, evolved in the tropics, um, and they made their way from Africa up into Europe, up into the mountains. And bees eat two foods. They're both floral foods, pollen and nectar. But when you get up into like the Swiss Alps and it's January, there's not a lot of pollen and nectar, right? So bees had to figure out a way to preserve their food. So bees figured out that by taking nectar and storing it in a certain crop that they have called a honey stomach, they can expose it to certain enzymes. And when they bring it back to the hive, they expose it to more of the enzymes. Then when they store it in a cell, they fan it off and dehydrate it to a really low moisture content. And thus they have honey. And honey is such a, honey is like a living food because it's full of organisms, you know, enzymes. And, uh, um, and the moisture content is so low that it can last and last. For instance, when they o opened Tutankhamun's uh, sarcophagus, they found honey in there, and it was still good. So my, my honey that I sell, I guarantee it for 5,000 years, but after that, the guarantee is voided. <laughs> um, humans, how are we doing on time? Nice, we're good. All right, so it's 100 million years is a lot of time, so. Um, Humans and bees' relationship goes back way, way, way back into antiquity. And we see things like um, cave paintings in Spain of honey hunters gathering honey, you know, 10,000 years ago. And uh, humans have always had a certain reverence for bees. We see bees in so many different cultures as, a, um, as a revered in a spiritual light of some sort in the ancient Egyptians and Greeks, uh, Chinese. Um, before we were beekeepers, we were honey hunters, and our ancestors would visit the same colonies year after year in, um, in trees or in caves. And when we hear that, that word hunter, we think to kill, but our ancestors knew how much they could take and not hurt the colony, because you wouldn't want to kill the colony that you want to come back year after year to gather the honey. And if we picture what our diet was, you know, 40,000 years ago, Honey must have been pretty amazing because there's nothing on earth, nothing in the um, temperate earth that has that sweetness. So, and it's been an amazing food that's been part of our um, human diet for tens and tens of thousands of years. So when, when, I, when we started to domesticate plants, when we started to domesticate animals, is when humans became beekeepers. Um, and beekeeping is an interesting thing because bees, they're kind of half domesticated, but they're half wild. Because we can cake bees, we can put them in a hive, we can um, manage them, but they're free to leave. There's no, there's no cage, there's no you know, fences. Bees are free to leave any time. We kind of just encourage them by providing a good habitat for them, and then we can manage them to, you know, produce honey and such and so forth. How you guys feeling? All right, good. Staying hydrated? So, there are no native honeybees in North America. We have 4,000 different species of bees in America. Um, in California, we have f f um, at least over 1,000 species of bees. But honeybees, um, particularly the honeybees that were most commonly kept, which is uh, we call the Western honeybee, Apis mellifera, was brought to Americas with the first um, <coughs> European settlers that came across. And it's pretty impressive that they got beehives, you know, on sailing ships across the Atlantic, and then eventually even got them, you know, through, through uh, down into the Caribbean and over the Isthmus of Panama and up the West Coast into California. Um, so all honeybees that we have here in North America are of European, Asian, or African descent. Um, 
when honeybees came to America, the first honeybees came here in the 1500s. And when they came to this new country for the Europeans, they, th they thrived. They found a nice home here with the endless forests and prairies. And particularly, they found a, a wonderful home on the American family farm. You see, the traditional American family farm has, a, um, has a windbreaks and hedgerows and pasture and orchards, multi-crops, animals, and it is a perfect um, habitat for honeybees. Um, and so honeybees thrived. We hear, so, we hear so much in the news um, nowadays about how bees are having issues and stuff like that. Major, what really started to happen was, uh, um, you, you see, bees and agriculture have this kind of married history that goes way back to when agriculture first started 10,000 years ago. And uh, um, a lot of things that happen with bees are, are an effect of what is happening in agriculture. So bees thrived in this country up until, you know, when agriculture started to change. And agriculture really started to change um, post-World War II. All that uh, technology of war came back. It was no longer used for war, so it was turned to domestic uses. So, you know, the technology we had for tanks became technology we used for tractors. Technology we used for chemicals of war became chemicals of biocides and fungicides, insecticides, and fertilizers. And suddenly, the farm changed from that family farm with the uh, hedgerows and the wind, wind blocks and the pastures and the orchards to a farm of just you know, hundreds of acres from one corner to the next with one single crop that could be tended to by a very small amount of people with large machinery and the chemicals to control all the uh, um, insects and fungus and uh, um, herbs that grew in the underbrush. So this was no longer a, um, a habitat for bees, you know, because bees can't live in that monocrop farm. Um, so as a, uh, as a remedy for that, beekeepers had to learn to truck their bees in from crop to crop because when one crop blossoms, when it's done, there's no more food for the bees. They have to move it to the next crop and pollinate that crop. And uh, um, people ask me all the time, you know, what, what is it that's hurting the honeybees? Is it this one pesticide? Is it this one um, disease? Is this this one cell phone signal? And really the answer to that is it's not any of those things, it's our way of living that we've created on this earth, this human ecology we've created where we grow food in a way that is unproductive to the growth of um, biodiversity in ecology. And uh, um, however, I'm not trying to go all doom and gloom because we're seeing um, so many good examples of ways that farmers can um, create the habitat for honeybees to live healthy. And um, it's really inspiring to be here at the um, Rage Lounge, the Regenera Regenerative Agriculture Garden Exhibit, because the examples that we're seeing here and the farmers that have been speaking over the last day and that will be speaking today are the ones that are pioneering some of the most inspiring um, methods of farming that support plants, bees, animals, and all life. Um, and with the cannabis, cannabis industry changing so much, we, um, we see that all these new farmers are coming in and they're taking different methodologies of growing. And a lot of people are going right to industrial agriculture and following their model. They're putting down black plastic and planting large monocrops. And uh, um, that is not conducive to life, to bees, to any life, you know? Because the bees need that, um, they need the underbrush. They need the herbs that grow. They need the flowers that grow naturally below um, crops. So if you put down black plastic, it's really, you've just taken away their food. And we all like to eat, so. It's not a good thing. Um, so I'll talk for a minute about 
what I do, one, one of the things that I do in beekeeping. Um, so I'm a bee breeder. I have lots of good conversations with cannabis breeders. My buddy Vio Vortex over here has always been a um, major guiding light to me and a um, discussion. And we, we talk about um, bee breeding and plant breeding. We can learn a lot from each other. Um, you see, if you were to break down the problems with bees into two categories, it would be um, just like humans, the internal and the external. The external is how, you know, is our landscape. It's how we farm, it's how we build our cities, how we build our homes, how we grow our food. But the internal is our DNA. Um, what's interesting about honeybees is honeybees were, were brought, like I said, they were all brought from Europe or Africa or Asia. And um, our border has been closed for over 100 years to honeybee imports except for a very few select um, um, permits that the USDA has given to different researchers to bring in different genetics. So we've kind of had like a um, somewhat of a bottlenecking of genetics in our country. And, uh, um, and people ask me all the time, like, what kind of bees do you, do you raise? Because there's many different subspecies of bees. But our, our bees are really... Um, mixed up, you know, and if you were really to look under a microscope and try and figure out or put them in a DNA sequencer and try and figure out, you know, what subspecies are the makeup, you'd see lots of different subspecies. So what we're breeding for is um, the traits that we see in honeybees that we feel are important for us. Our single biggest problem with honeybees is, is, the, the, is a mite. Cannabis um, growers can relate to that. This mite's Latin name is Varroa destructor, and it's a very uh, aptly named bug. It just wipes out honeybees, and then worse than that, it's a vector of um, viruses. But we find that honeybees um, have a natural resistance to these mites, you know? And uh, um, it's interesting, in our country, we have some really, really big um, queen producers that, that are pretty much responsible for for uh, many of the queens made, they did some genetic testing and found out that is like 90% of the um, bees in the country were the daughters of 200 queens, which is really, really small, you know, genetic, genetic um, diversity. So what we're looking for in bees is um, natural resistance to this mite, a resilience, as well as being productive and gentle because I don't like to be, wear the big white suit. I don't like to wear the gloves. I don't like to get hot and sweaty. I'd like to wear a t-shirt and a veil and go work my bees and not get stung to, you know, to the moon and back. So um, what's interesting about honeybees is um, it's like open-made cannabis. They, um, queen bees, when they're born, they, uh, um, they mate only only one period of their life. They only wait right in the beginning, the first week of their life. They mate with up to um, typically 20 or 25 different drones. So when, within one queen bee, there is a genetic um, variance of the multitude of fathers that, are, that she's mated with. And um, they, mate open, they, they open mate in the air. They can fly for miles. So we ha really have to isolate our bees if we want to have any kind of control over who they're mating with. And a queen has an organ called a spermatheca. And uh, um, this spermatheca can uh, store millions of sperm her whole life. And if you look under it under a microscope, it's like this swirling globe of, you know, of sperm, and it's pretty amazing looking. So one hive has that different um, genetics in it. How are we doing on time? Five minutes? All right. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking about breeding, and I'm going to talk about one more thing. Um, it's about the medicine of the hive. Um, a beehive, you know, people, people see a beehive as like a, a having the ability to pollinate and produce honey as a food crop. However, um, I really see a beehive as like a medicine cabinet. A beehive is full of many, many different kind of medicines with many different uses, and uh, um, 
us humans have known about all these uses going back millenniums. Um, honey is an amazing medicine. It's really good for you to eat. Like I said, it's full of enzymes, so it's actually like a living food. So when you make your tea and you want to put some honey in it, don't put that honey in it when it's boiling hot because it'll kill all those enzymes. You've got to wait till it's like drinkable. And then you get the benefits of those enzymes. Honey is an amazing topical medicine. Um, honey has this amazing thing where um, you, if you put honey on human skin, it turns on something in honey that starts to create um, hydrogen peroxide. This only happens when it touches skin of a mammal. And when it turns on the hydrogen peroxide, it turns it on on a very low level, like a low dose. So when we use like hydrogen peroxide from the store on a wound, it burns the wound and then dissipates. But honey will give a wound like a perfect slow drip of hydrogen peroxide, as well as coating it and letting it breathe and yet sealing it um, from particles to get into your wound. Beyond that, it's uh, antimicrobial. It kills bacteria, fungus, protozoa, and so it's this kind of perfect topical medicine. And, and I've actually personally seen you know, almost miracles using it on burns and wounds. Anybody here know what a propolis is? All right. Propolis, propolis is a, um, it's a substance that bees collect from flower buds and from trees. And propolis is one of the most antimicrobial um, active natural ingredients in the world. And so propolis is this amazing medicine that can fix all kind of ailments. It's really good for, um, for your teeth and your gums. It's good for sore throats. You see a lot of like propolis sprays in the winter and um, it's this amazing medicine. Um, bees collect three, four things. They collect nectar to make honey, pollen, uh, propolis, and water. Pollen is the highest um, protein food in the world. It's like 50% protein, full of vitamins, minerals, lipids. It's like this amazing, um, amazing uh, uh, like health elixir. And uh, um, we were just talking the other night about pollen, and I was saying one of my first jobs with a beekeeper, we were, um, we were working in Big Sur, and we were, we were um, doing a honey harvest. And we had, we'd wake up every morning at 4 and drive down there before the sun rose. We'd work all day till dark, and then we'd load trucks at night and get to bed about midnight. So it was just really like seven days a week. It was really grinding, heavy, heavy work. It was hot. But we were all just harvesting um, pollen at the same time. And in my truck, I had this whole bag of pollen just in my driver's seat. And I was constantly mowing handfuls of pollen. And I never got tired. Four in the morning would roll around. I was like, put on the boots, ready to go. And my boss and the other guys were like, ugh. I was like, dude, it's the pollen. Um, yeah, and uh, um, royal jelly. Royal jelly royal jelly is this amazing um, substance that bees create. It's a substance that they feed to, uh, um, to, to baby queen bees, be queen bees in the larval phase. And they get it by ingesting pollen, ingesting honey. They change it with a gland in their head called the hyperpharyngeal gland. It's full of all these amazing proteins. And there's this one protein called vitagelin, which is just this amazing um, kind of life-giving substance. Um, when bees consume the vitagelin, they can grow fat bodies. And a uh, forager bee, a worker bee, who would only live six weeks in the summer can live six months in the winter. And so it kind of has the same effects on us. It's this life, uh, it's like a life elixir. Um, supposedly if you eat royal jelly, you know, you'll live to like 500 years old and have a great sex life up to 500 years old. <laughs> um, real quick, beeswax is an um, amazing substance too. Um, I love beeswax candles. Uh, under the summer solstice sun, the bees are gathering pollen and nectar and they're turning it into wax through glands in their abdomen. We harvest that wax and we can bring the summer sunlight back in the winter by burning it. It's, um, not only is it a clean burning wax with a full spectrum light just like the sun, it actually um, creates negative ions that pull particles out of the air. So not only is it just a clean burning, it's actually cleaning your air and it's totally sustainable as opposed to, you know, all these other waxes. 
and we got nine seconds left. My name is Aiden Wing. Uh, my beekeeping business is Wings of Nature. I got a little booth outside, so we actually have a kind of a, um, if you want to talk more about bees, we're kind of having a um, mellow little workshop outside. So thank you very much.